This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. And welcome everybody to this episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. I am your host, John Allen. I just want to say something real quick to all my viewers and listeners out there. Uh, Look in the description of this episode for a couple of links that you can click on if you would like to support my work here at this podcast. And today I'm speaking with Rob Yarber. What's up, Rob? Hey, Rob. How's it going? I want to tell your, I want to tell your customers, your viewers, your, your supporters also. Yes, man, look out for John Allen, man. Look out for Big John. Everybody needs help. We all got to support each other, you know? One hand washes the other. We both wash the face. Thank you so much for saying that, Rob. And I am a true believer in not just in networking, but once that connection is established, trying to find ways where I can learn something, where I can be motivated, inspired, and where I can possibly do something like that in return and all things yeah. support. Support is, is, I mean, we need it. That's what keeps us moving. That's what keeps us shaking. That's what keeps us exploring the earth. So speaking of exploring the earth, <laughs> now you, you get around, Rob. Where, where are you from and where are yeah. you now? Tell people. Well, uh, I grew up in Herndon, Virginia, northern Virginia. It's about uh, maybe five, ten kilometers, or it's a few miles away from Washington D.C. Um, right there, in North Virginia. That's that's where I'm from. So I'm very proud of that fact. And uh, where I am right now, um, as you can see, I'm in uh, Kos, Greece, Kos Island, Greece. And I'm coming to you live and direct from European Bartender School, Kos. And, uh, you know, we have over here, hard work, spirit, and soul. There you go. That's what it's all about. I it's love about, it. Oh, it's, it's a good uh, good coming together of uh, mantras. Now, now, is that a slogan that you made up? No, no, no. Oh, I, wish, I can't take credit for that. That's the European bartender slogan. Okay. You know, okay. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, like, I have a personal slogan. I like never nervous, never scared, confident in all situations. Rob does it all. Never nervous, <laughs> never scared, nah, confident, that one up. confident in all situations. <laughs> Rob does it all. All situations. I love it. Yes, sir. Now, when you when you live like that, the sky is the limit. And that phrase, yeah. Yeah. that phrase, the sky is the limit, it really fits for you. You've got a heck of a story. And I purposely stopped myself uh, after literally just a few minutes i stopped myself from looking into your story more because i want to experience everything about your life so far as much as i can now in this conversation that i'm having with you um can you talk a little bit about some of the adversity that you met in the states and your initial desire to explore other places in particular norway can, can you start with that? Yeah, I can start with that. Um, you know, I've had a lot of adversity in my life, and I can say honestly that probably 99% of it is because of myself. So um, basically once a lot of mosquitoes. Sorry. <laughs> um, basically once I, I guess, took ownership of that and realized that you know, my issues were my doing and change that then i started seeing a lot of success and a lot of things happening um i did five years in prison five years in a maximum security prison when i was 21 me and my buddy we got invited to a party by some girls the guys at the party didn't know anything about it (laughs) they did not want us there and so uh how can i say they, they they weren't thrilled about us being there and they were very excited to kick us out <laughs> okay and so <laughs> they, they didn't ask politely and no 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 the, <laughs> i tried to turn around and leave my, and my buddy the white friend of mine we're still friends to this day uh he was on the ground getting choked out by these people it was crazy and I, I always think about it like being 21 i you know i had a huge ego i didn't even know it you know you have a huge you have a huge ego you think you're untouchable you're clearly not thinking about the consequences and repercussions of your actions. So I I think about that day all the time. Like I could have grabbed him. We could have left. We could have done so many different things, but you know, I just saw 20 people heading towards us 
and I had played sports. I had some baseball bats in my trunk. I ran out to the car. I grabbed two bats. I gave one to him. I hit the guy off of him, and I gave one to him, and I was like, yo, just hit everybody who's not me. Okay. So apparently everybody's attacking us, so just don't hit me. I don't care. Hit everybody, right? And at the time, gosh, it's like, how stupid could you be? At the time, I thought that was my best course of action, and it was and, terrible. And you were what? That was 20, like the worst thing you, were, you could do. You were 21 you know, years old? I was 21. As a 21-year-old, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I don't want these guys to be able to say they beat us up and all this and all that. And now the 37 year old is like, dude, who cares? Who well, cares well, if these 20 guys can drink beers for the rest of their life? Hey, remember that time we beat up that guy? Yeah. It, it, it's stupid. But isn't that what life so, does to us? It's gonna, you know, it, show, it shows us the error of our ways. But, and, and I, I think in a situation like that, yeah. a person could very easily fall into that shoulda, woulda, coulda mindset. But it looks like you have just kept on marching oh, yeah. and you've taken your lessons as they've come yeah. and you've kept on moving. Am I right? Well, yeah. And it is about taking ownership. You know, I could say all day, you know, a few miles north of where I was in Oregon in the state of Washington in the state, uh, they have a mutual combat law. So... If you got two parties and they're consenting fighting each other, you can have the entire police force around you like a fight club, and they just watch until really? somebody says, "Okay, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah." That's a fact. Okay. And the visible line, another state, and that's what it is. But I wasn't in the state of Washington; I was in the state of Oregon, and okay. what I did was very much against the law, and I was guilty of that, and I take ownership for that, and I apologize for that, and I have a lot of remorse just for the stupidity. You know, of that whole situation, you know, I move forward past it and I try to figure out how I can still have a blessed life and how I can move forward and um, not have that be a lifelong punishment for myself. Were there any serious, in were there any serious injuries in that incident? Uh, I believe, uh, I mean, I had to pay a, a lot of money for somebody going in a, an ambulance. So I oh, think okay. somebody might have broken a collarbone. I'm not sure. You know, I just try to, I paid the fines. I paid everything they asked me to do. I haven't seen the people since, but if they ever see this, even though this is 15 years later, you know, yeah, yeah. there was an apology from me to you for being stupid and, and doing that. Cause that was uncalled for regardless of any actions towards me. My actions are always my own and I made the wrong choice. As, as I'm, as I'm, as I said earlier, I'm using this, uh, conversation here to get to know you better uh, and to, to appease the curiosity that I have about you. And one thing I see already is that you are a compassionate man and you're a man who takes responsibility. Yeah. A lot of people who, you know, be, being incarcerated for any length of time can mm -hmm. have a tendency to be damaging for a person. Am I right when I say that your period of incarceration has strengthened you in some way? I don't see any bitter. I don't. I don't hear. I don't hear any. I don't hear any bitterness in you from from this experience. Well, I, I was bitter for a time, but when you take ownership, you can't be bitter because this is your actions, man. Like, dude, you did that. No one else made you do that. You did that. So how can you be mad at someone else? You know, I had an opportunity to walk away, and I didn't. And um, why I didn't is, you know, being young, dumb, and all that. But I still had a choice, and I could have left, and I could have left, and I could have called the, the cops on them. Oh, hey, officer, there's 20 yeah. people attacking us, you know? And the officer was like, you should have did that. Yeah. <laughs> and the day would have been a joke. Right. But I didn't even think about it. And, uh, you know, I just can only accept my responsibility. I go, I win, and uh, prison is not a fun place to be. It's a very violent place, very dangerous place. Um, I had a, yeah, uh, I don't recommend it. I had a conversation. <laughs> I had a podcast episode with a Norwegian gentleman who was incarcerated both in Norway and in the United States. And he talked, yeah. he talked about, um, the violence of it, or at least the violence that some of these people that he came across could have done. Um, yeah. Talk, talk about that a little bit, because again, you, 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 you appear to be quite a peaceful, self-assured, uh, non-bitter man. That's the impression I'm getting from your writings, from your blog, and that's the impression I'm getting from talking with yeah. you now. How did you? How how did being incarcerated not turn you into that classic, um, uh, angry, 
uh, formerly incarcerated black man? How did how did that not happen to you? Well, I would say, you know, in life, I guess, I don't want to say like math, but it's like, you know, in life, you know, you act one way when you're with your homeboys, you act another way when you're around your family, yeah. you act another way when you're with your wife, you act another way when you're with kids. It's all you. It's like a different you. And uh, being incarcerated and in that environment, it's like a, it's like a, like a terror dome, you you know what I mean? A thunderdome of just violence. And if you don't acclimate yourself to that scenario and that environment, that situation, then you will, you will become a victim. So, you know, this is who I am. You know, I want to be happy. I want to be having jokes. I want to be fun. But, you know, everything's not fun, you know? There's four people coming at you and they all have knives. It's not the time to joke. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you, so, actually, did you um, actually experience that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything you can imagine. Uh, you know, the state of Oregon only has one maximum security prison. And that's the Oregon State Penitentiary. Right. And that's where I did my time. That's where I paroled from. Uh, and, you know, if you see, if you read the, the paper, the Oregonian, and, you know, this is hypothetically, you know, uh, man kills four people, da, 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 whatever, and you see a picture and all that, it would be like 30 days later, and that dude would be walking right past you. Right. You'd be like, oh. Right. You know, and that is... I, for me, my life, my parents are amazing. I didn't grow up around crime. I didn't grow up around drugs. I didn't grow up around violence. I lived a very amazing childhood that I, as I grow older, realized how much more amazing it was based yeah. on the lives I've seen other people have. And, you know, I've been sold up with people that, you know, parents, alcoholics, drug addicts, they've been on the streets since they were seven. They're all this type of stuff. And I just feel for them because it feels like, you know, you didn't even have a chance. Now you're here looking for a second chance. You never even had a first one. Right, right. And, and it makes it even worse in my case because I did, and I was stupid. Nothing I've done wrong has ever been anything my parents ever taught me. My parents only taught me the right way. If I listened to them, I would never be in trouble. I, Isn't that the way it children, always is? Listen to your parents. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> there you really go. They really care about you. They're looking out for you for real. Say it loud for the children they in really the back. They're looking out for you. you think, say, it loud, being lame, but, say it loud for the children yeah, in the back. Being lame is okay. <laughs> Because, you know, I thought I was being cool and I was yeah. in prison. So yeah. 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 yeah, Nobody cool was in prison, let me tell you. Well, I would think that the that foundation that you learned from having good parents, uh, the lessons that they taught yeah. you, is the reason why you came out of the other side of incarceration being the solid brother that you are now, you know, with kindness, compassion, and, and, and optimism yeah. and a sense of adventure. Because, again, that incarceration experience breaks a lot of people. Um, and, and it will, but if you're mentally tough, and you got to be mentally tough because that can break you. I mean, you're in a cage, and when you're in a cage, a lot of violence is very easy to turn into an animal. And, I mean, I've had to do things in prison I was not proud of in order to survive, in order to protect myself, in order to not become a victim, you know, and... I mean, you got real live killers, like real live killers. Yeah, like you said, yeah. Like, everything, and when somebody like, like that is trying to attack you, yeah, you think they won't kill you? <laughs> yeah, like you say, just you know, just you put, know? Put, put your put your mind into this, uh, viewers and listeners. Put your mind into this. You read in the newspaper, you know, this person has just chopped up, uh, you know, uh, his own family, and then you see him walking across the prison yard or in the or in the cell block or something. That, that or maybe he's your cellmate. Maybe. Your cell opens up and here he is walking into your cell. And it's like, oh, man. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, you can't call nobody for help, you know? You can't appear weak. You can't ask, ask for help. You can't talk to the police, the guards about nothing. You, you just got to gotta handle it. And you really got to dig deep to find out who you are as a man when you're in a life or death situation. Are you going to choose life or are you going to allow yourself to be killed? To be, you know, And it, it sounds so drastic, but... It really is that drastic, and it's not a joke. It's not a game. And so I tell everybody, don't go to jail. Don't go to prison. Be a square. Live your life. The real cool people are the ones that have a job, have a paycheck, never get in trouble, take care of their family. That is a real dude. That's a real man. That's a real woman. This I, other stuff is all movies. Don't I, listen to I've it. I've done a lot of work with children and their families up through the years, and one thing I tell kids, one thing I tell teenagers is uh, let life be boring now so that you are free to experience the excitement of life 
in your older years. You know, let it be boring. You know, okay, skip that party. Yeah. You don't have to go out drinking and, and, and smoking weed and, and doing this, that, and the other. You don't have yeah, to do that. You really now. don't. Be still, be quiet, be observant, have fun, and enjoy your childhood or enjoy your teenage years. But let it be a little, a little bit boring. You don't need all of that excitement that you see on TV or that you hear through the music you listen to. You don't need to live that. Be boring now so you can hey, live exciting I'll be, things I'll be later. Honest. I'll be honest. About 90 Eight percent of all the musicians, rappers, rock stars, well maybe rock stars, they really do be living that rock star life. But rappers, they're not doing that stuff. Listen, a guy can't do drugs all day every day and then release five albums, okay? It's not possible. It's not, it's happening. not possible to be that functional and, and have mind altering things. And I can tell you right now, my life is amazing. My life is amazing. I've been to like thirty three, thirty some countries and it's amazing. If I was sitting in a jail cell, being cool for who? Yeah, you know. I'm on a Greek island right now. That's amazing. And finally, with good internet. <laughs> oh, man. Listen, hey, shout out to Lawrence Apartments <laughs> for, for the internet. <laughs> because Lawrence Apartments, Big L, he's the one hooking it up. He gave me his private internet connection. Wouldn't give me the password, but he typed it in for me. For, for, uh, <laughs> for, for the people watching and listening now, this is a little inside joke, Rob, and I have because we, we were supposed to do this episode, what is it, like six yeah, five, six hours ago, something like that. But uh, because of the, yeah. the, you know, Greece is a beautiful nation, uh, but the internet there is not beautiful. So we had to go through some hoops no, and here we no. are now. Here we are now. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so, so you come out of this situation uh, where you're incarcerated and you come out into the fresh air and sunshine and, and into freedom and of course, you have a period of parole mm-hmm. and, and a little bit of oversight during that period. But what is your mindset when you walk out of those doors? When you come through that gate, what are you going to do with yourself? What's going through your mind at that point? Well, so, you know, I can be honest that when I went, uh, I've actually been twice. When I went the first time, I was 21 when I got in trouble, 22 when I went in, so I had my my 23rd, my 24th, my 25th, and my 26th birthday in Oregon State Penitentiary. And uh, okay. during one of those times, I was celled up with a, a Hispanic guy. His name was Rabbit. And Rabbit was in there. It's, it's, it's like the movie Blow. I kid you not. <laughs> Rabbit was in there for selling cocaine. His mother was his co-defendant. He was doing like 10 years. So I'm in the cell with this guy for 23 hours a day. Just imagine, right now, you know, I'm a professional bartender. I instructed for European Bartender School. If you're locked up with me for 23 hours a day, you're going to learn some cocktails. <laughs> you know, you're going to learn some drinks. So if you're in an environment, if you were hanging out with a mechanic, you're going to learn how to fix cars. The barber's going to teach you how to cut hair. So I'm in there with rabbits. So what's he, tell, what's he teach me how to do? And I used to think, I used to think that felons were, they're all lazy. They get out of jail. They don't want to get a job. Right. You know, and I got out and I was trying to get a job everywhere. And I never in life had not gotten a job that I had applied for. And now I couldn't get a job. McDonald's, washing dishes, I couldn't get a job nowhere. And Rabbit had given me this number, and he was like, you know, if you ever need, I'm not saying you do, if you ever need, give this number a call. We, we, we'll hook you up and we, you know, make some money for yourself, right? And I was like, man, this guy, you know, I'll be fine. But it happened. I ended up doing that. Right. So the first time was accidental. My parents would tell you, you know, the first time, you know, okay, that's a freak accident. But this time you're choosing to be like ridiculous. Now, how long, so, now how long after you had gotten out uh, from your first time in, did you then go that route through rabbit? How long, how long of a time frame was That was it? like maybe like, I was probably like six months, six to eight months of trying to find a job, trying okay. to do all that. And then finally being like, you know, yeah. Man, I don't really got nothing, and, you know, I was just, it was all, it was a weird synergy because I never knew anyone in life that ever did cocaine, ever. Mm. And then, all of a sudden, I'd be going to, like, a party, and I got out to four years, I'm at a party, I see, like, two dudes came out the bathroom, and I'm like, man, I've been sitting on this couch for, like, an hour. When did these guys walk into the bathroom, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, How long, what are they doing in there, you know? And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking all type of wild stuff, what they're doing in the bathroom. And my buddy, a friend of mine, sitting on the couch with me, and he's like, what do you mean? They're, they're doing coke. I'm like, wait, you guys do coke? 
Yeah. Like, when did, yeah. Well, hold on. When did everybody do, start doing coke? I, I mean, they're like, bro, you've been gone like four years. A lot of things have changed. And then I made that's part of me because I was like, wait a minute. Like, I know, that, you know, it's like, look, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And yeah. uh, it's like, I was thinking, because I never did a coke at that time. So I was just thinking, if I call this guy and I get this, then I didn't feel like a real drug dealer because these are my friends. These are my actual right, friends right. I'm hanging out with. So they're getting it from someone anyway. So I'm like, look, if you just spent the same amount of money with me, then you can just get it from me. I make money. You still get what you get. Like everybody wins. Nobody loses. Like a carnival, right? So I did that. And then uh, I did that for like a year. And then a kid at the university got caught. Um, and that's crazy too, because now in the state of Oregon, marijuana is completely 100% recreational. Yeah. But at the time, it wasn't. So he had a party and a noise violation. The cops came over. They searched his house. He was growing weed plants. That's manufacturing marijuana. And he was on financial aid, which means he's going to lose his financial aid. So they told him, they asked him, where you get it from? He was like, I got it from him. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay. Which is true. And again, I have to take responsibility. Sure, you know, sure. I can feel bad that he snitched on me. But if I never do that, he can never snitch on me. So, that's okay. that's, again, that's, that's, that's the truth. Fault. Yeah, that's the way of looking at it. So then, so. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. So you got hooked up for that, and how long were you in then? So then I did uh, another year, and because of that first that first case, the judge was well within her right to give me five more years. And I was thinking, you know, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell on my connect because that's just not what I'm gonna do personally. Um, <laughs> not very safe for your safety to do that. Anyway. No, I was going to say, but, there's uh, a fear element in there as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is not the type of people that you do that to. And um, so, but anyway, that's just my principle of it because, you know, I got caught for what I was doing. You know, if this guy's going to get in trouble, let him get caught. You know, it yeah. ain't going to be because of me. So I was thinking, how can I affect my life positively and affect positive change without being somebody that, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to tell on nobody. So I was just like, okay. So, you know, I went to, went to rehab. I did cognitive, uh, thinking, cognitive things, uh, cognitive thinking courses in yep. rehab. Um, I started speaking to you just about drugs in general. I was not cool. It's not fun. It's not cool to do them. It's not cool to sell them. It's really not cool to be around people that's on them. And everything, like all the things you hear are lies. Like those people aren't happy. Yeah. They might be happy for that moment, but they're not happy. And I did, I did a lot of work on myself to, to prove to the judge, like, please give me, give me another chance. Like, you know, I know you could give me five years, but man, yeah. if I do four, I'm out for a year and a half and then I do five, it's going to be really hard to, to become a positive person after that. Absolutely. And the judge, I, I, I think her name is Janet Holcomb. I think because later when I was bartending, she came into my bar and I, I thanked her so much because she oh, gave you me ran into like, her later. Yeah. I ran into her later and I had a lot of, a lot of positive people. Um, a lot of people wrote letters to the judge. Dennis Erickson was a two time national championship winning college coach at NCAA, uh, NFL football coach. You know, he wrote a letter to the judge. A lot of people in high places wrote letters to the judge saying, I've known Robert since he was a kid. Man, he made one mistake and he's compounding it with another idiotic mistake. But trust us, he is a good person. <laughs> I am, I really am. And so uh, she looked at me and she was like, man, I hope I don't regret this. But I will give you 18 months with good time. You'll be out in 14. And please don't make me regret this. And uh, I haven't made her regret it. I did the 14 months, so I did. I've done a total of 54 months uh, in prison. And I got out and I just was really focused on changing my life. Like a lot of people, their, their criminality, everything goes up, yes. you know, a little bit of time, more time, more yep. time, more time. Yeah. Mine's going down to nothing now. Now it's, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you that that in itself, if we don't even say another word, if we end this discussion now, that right there is a powerful message. It's a powerful example of what taking responsibility yeah. can do for oneself. It's a powerful example of what, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a solid foundation in your childhood can also do. Because, again, I feel that if it, if it hadn't been for your parents, uh, good guidance and, and, and good parenting 
uh, when you were a child, you probably would have reacted to your incarceration in a totally different way. I've seen that happen so much I, I would, where, I mean, I it, just, it just makes things easier. When you have good parenting, life is easier. I'm not saying life is perfect, and I'm not saying life cannot throw yeah. some, some uh, you know, throw some knives at you and stick you in your back, but, but it, it is easier with that good foundation. So hats off in all respect to your parents. I got to say that. Definitely. My mom, man, she's my biggest fan. She's the only one that ever believed in me, no matter what, through my down and out periods, through everything. She's this wonderful woman, and I wouldn't be anywhere without her today. My father is also an amazing person. If I was uh, half the man he is, I'd be twice the man I am. And that's that's a real, that's real. That's and just be beautiful. To, that's beautiful, you know? man. And you express it in such a humble way. You tell your story in, yeah. from a position oh. of humility. And, and it may, it just, it, it, it resonates. It, it resonates. Well, thank you. Thank you, man. You know, and then that's it. You know, look, I can be mad at the judge. The judge, she doesn't break the law. She's at home all day living her best life. And then she comes to work and she's got to deal with you being like, why are you selling her? You know, yeah. I didn't ask you to come be in front of me. You right. came in front of me. Yeah. So I can't be mad at her. I can only thank her for if she had a choice, you know, and she could have been like, man, throw this guy away. Who cares? You know, yeah. forget his life. And she didn't. And with that, if she did that, I never, I never travel the world. I never become a Barry Sea fisherman. I never do movies in Norway. I never become a bartender instructor for the greatest bartending school in the world. Like for real, like my life is so blessed right now. And it all started with just making the right choices. Exactly. And it's really easy because the wrong choices, you can see them a mile away. Once you start focusing and paying attention, it's easy to not make them. It, and it really is. It really is that simple. But that simplicity, of course, can be drowned in a lot of complicated distractions. But it really is simple. If you have focus on what you know is good for you, um, the, the road opens up. <laughs> the road really and truly opens up. And, I, and again, that's I mean, not an easy it, it thing. Really to, does. That's not an easy thing to do if you get caught up in distractions. But if you can avoid or if you can handle those distractions properly, the road really does open up once you focus. So you you oh. you come out of your second uh, incarceration. Then, um, mm -hmm. what's your mindset then? What are you trying to do? Uh, what do you do to get started on the path that brought you to where you are today? My mindset. My mindset then was. Uh, pardon me. My mindset then was I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to. I wanted to be a good person. I wanted to. I always felt like I was a good person. Like, even when I was doing the wrong stuff, I felt like I was trying to be the best person I could be in a bad environment, the best person I could be making the bad decisions, you know, like, you know, uh, I, 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 maybe that's the delusion, the self delusion, but I always felt like I was trying to be, you know, a better, a better person. And I was just stuck kind of like in a loop. And so when I got out, I was like, I don't want any of that stuff for my life. I don't want, I clearly, I don't have any room for error anymore. Okay. I don't. The fact that I was able to be in and out this last time very quickly was just by the grace of that judge and uh, nothing else, nothing. I mean, I did a lot of work to prove to her that she should give me that opportunity, but I could have did that same work and she could have not given me the opportunity. So really it, it was, it was on her. And I just, I wanted, I wanted to make that judge proud. I wanted to make, you know, uh, the Corvallis Police Department. I wanted them to know that I was serious about my freedom and I, I wasn't going to be doing anything. Like, I mean, I'm so like, I've had five knee surgeries. And if I get Vicodin or something, any friend of mine is like, yo, can I get a Vicodin pill? I won't even do that. Like, I'm, listen, I'm scared straight and I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> okay. Well, but you know what? When, when that whole thing, uh, you talk about being scared straight. <clears throat> when that whole thing with drugs, whether it's sales or drug use, drug addiction, when it hits home, if your eyes are open, it will make a it will make a big difference. The whole reason why I'm talking to you, the whole reason why I have this podcast, is because I lost my son to a heroin overdose, twenty nine November twenty nineteen, mm -hmm. and it yeah, brought I'm that. Whole, about that. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, I'm still trying to deal with it. I don't know if I'm dealing with it in the right way, but I'm dealing with it and just, tr you know, trying to grow from it. But that whole thing with drug addiction, drug use, drug sales, you know, I used, I'm, I'm a former police officer. It put that whole world in a totally new perspective for me. I look at it in a totally different way than I did before because it 
now it touched me in a different way. It didn't have anything to do with my job. It didn't have anything to do with any kind of uh, social work I was doing for children and families. This was me. This was my family. This was my son. And that's why, that's kind of what I was touching on with you, where you were met with a traumatic situation, you know, being incarcerated, not once, but twice. But because you had your eyes open, you have obviously you know without me knowing exactly how but you've obviously managed to take those traumatic experiences and put them to work to make a positive difference in your life because from what i see and from what i hear now as i talk to you you're living one of the most positive lives (laughs) that i've ever encountered and that's that goes down to the reason why i asked you to come on because i think i can learn something from you um you know, like I say, I don't. I have no idea if I'm dealing with my son's uh, passing in the right way, but I'm trying to find something in that tragedy and in that trauma that can propel me forward in a positive way. And you've done that, incarcerated twice, and here you are living the life you're living. You know, I kind of got sidetracked now, but I just wanted to. I just, I just saw the opportunity mm-hmm. to vocalize my reason for asking you to come on and i already before we're we're even halfway finished i i thank you for coming on because i'm learning from you everything you're saying right now is teaching me something well i do for having me on and you know in my opinion there's no right or wrong way to deal with personal tragedy and trauma no is everybody's different so what works for somebody may not work for you what works for you may not work for somebody else and as long as if you feel like you're affecting people in a positive way and you're bringing good vibes to other people, to the world, to humanity, then it can't be wrong. And, you know, it always hits home. It always it hits harder, of course, when it's at home. Here you are, you're an officer. You know, you're trying to protect the world from this very thing and it's happening in your own right. backyard. Right. And that's got to be tough. You know, like, my, you know, my father was a special athlete. My mother... Is like, if it rains, look, weed is legal all day. And she's a cancer survivor. And she will not touch the stuff. I'm like, man, what? This is not even, it could rain drugs. My mom is never going to do anything like that. So imagine, I can only, I can't even imagine, I can only try to imagine the, the heartbreak and the heartache they feel when their child is making just decisions and catastrophe, just horrible decisions that don't come from them right, at all right and you know selling drugs doing drugs man i've been down bad i've done them all been in rehab all that stuff people say oh what's your drug of choice what are my choices you know uh <laughs> it, it, it's been like that and so i i feel and i understand and that's why i look at people and i can be like you know like i'm the real deal of everything that you bad good all of that and if I can have a blessed life and I can make the right choices, you know, because I've been down and out, I'm sure people look down on me. This guy will never get it right. Yeah. And, you know, that was deserved because those are the choices I was making at that time. And I stopped making those choices. I made better choices. And I, wow, look at this. I have a better life. Amazing. And, and so how long, how long after you got out from your second period of incarceration, how long did it take before you felt, I mean, it's one thing to have a mindset and a, de- and a desire to turn your life around, but did something happen? Mm-hmm. And at what point did something happen where you felt, you really felt the change? You really felt like you were on the right well, path to something better? I mean, it, it started with, I guess, looking inward, admitting to yourself that, you know, you've been making bad choices. <laughs> there was a time in my life as a grown man, that my choices were so bad that I would call my mom and or dad for any decision, even if it was obvious. I just wanted to make wow. sure because normally if I'm making the decision, it's probably wrong. <laughs> it's like so that's you, where I was at in my life. So does that translate into um, you having a, a, a period of low self-esteem or low self-confidence then? Uh, it was low self-esteem, low self-confidence. You know, I had started out as a drug dealer that had never done drugs, and then I ended up as a drug addict who didn't sell drugs. Right. <laughs> so it's a heck of a change. Uh, I had that stuff to battle. Yeah, that, you know, that stuff happened, and it, things had changed. So it was like, you know, I was still, you know, when you have an addiction thing going on, 
that's internal. Like you have to, you have to work on that on yourself. So the things that come with that, like all the crimes people commit and stuff like that, you know, I was trying to be like, okay, I'm not doing none of that other stuff. Like I'm not going to get high and rob your house. You know, I'm going to get high and stay in my house. I'm not going over. <laughs> you know, so it's like, um, so I just started figuring out, okay, if I'm not making always the best choices, how can I at least stop myself from making <laughs> so let's go a little bit at a time. So, um, you know, don't commit crimes, don't sell drugs. And now I say to Oregon, uh, all drugs are decriminalized, user amounts and everything, which I think is good because so do someone I. like so me, do I. I wasn't committing crimes. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't committing crimes. I, I, it was my issue internally that I needed to fix. So while I had the mindset of someone who was like, all right, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I still had lingering effects of drug addiction. And I mean, you always do, but I mean like active, like, you know, I could be great and then have a bad weekend. And then, you know, it was like, it was, yeah. it was a lot of up and down, up and down until I guess I just realized I'm never going to, maybe other people can, and I'm not here to knock nobody, but my life, I'm never going to get the places I want to go if I'm using drugs or have anything going on like that. So it was just something I had to cut out. And um, so it took a little bit of time, you know, a couple Does, years there, of up and down, 10 months clean, you know, a week dirty, a year clean. Okay. You know, okay. Stuff like that. Well, okay, so so now, just, just to touch for a, a, a second longer on, on, on the issue of addiction, now you're several years clean. Yeah. How does that? Mm -hmm. How does that addiction uh, um, affect you now? Do you ever feel a pull towards it? Is it something that you have to consciously um, resist at any times? Maybe, maybe you, maybe you, uh, um, maybe you have a stressful day at the job or something, and you might get a an inclination, or you might feel the pull of a previous desire. Well. Um, well, no, cause I can say, I can say truthfully that the last time I ever did any drugs, I had like, I had, I don't know. I had like a, an epiphany. It was almost like looking in the fourth dimension or something that it just, everything hit me. Like, this is just not for me. This is why the things are happening to me because this is not meant for me. And I don't know everyone else's stories with it, but it was just, it was an epiphany that was like, it, I don't know. It's just not meant for me. Yeah. So I look at it and, uh, you know, like I've been there, like I was in Dublin, Ireland. Right. And there was, there was drugs everywhere, like yeah. everywhere. And uh, drugs are everywhere. So you can't run away from drugs. They're always no. going to be wherever you go. Yeah. And I just make the choice not to, and because I know the consequences, I know the, the repercussions. I know that, if I go and get high, something great that was going to happen to me will go away. Yeah. And while I can't, you know, I could be in a room by myself, so I can't say it's like, oh, somebody knows, you know what I mean? But <laughs> it, it, I know. Yeah. So yeah. I just try to make it so that I do that. But there are times, like, I don't ever have any times where I feel like I really want to get high. Like, not anymore. Um, yeah. Because I just know, like, I'm living such a blessed life and things are going so well. And it'd be foolish. Like, yeah. <laughs> it'd right. be foolish. Right. But I will tell you this, I was on this other Greek island like last week, uh, to Seremos, Ser I'm going to say that wrong, please. Anyway, it was another Greek island not far away from Kos, and there was a, a, a honey seller, like somebody selling honey, they had all these different types of honey, and he was like, here, you know, taste the honey. And I tasted the honey, and it gave me a flashback to a taste of a drug. Oh, wow. It was so weird. Wow. And I was like, that's. Wow, that's uh Wow, that's, that's heavy. Not what I expected, that's know? heavy. Um it didn't yeah, it didn't make me want to go do it, but it just so sometimes temptation things can come from you, come to you from anywhere. Yeah. Like, come out of left field. That's why they're called temptation. Exactly. <laughs> uh so you know, but well, God bless you. I, well, do, God, I choose life. I choose to live my best life. Well, amen. Amen. And God bless you for for making it through um, through addiction, because uh, as I experienced, not everybody makes it through that. Um, so God bless you. That says no, something. That I says think something. Really good people. Well, yeah, you know, and and it's um, 
I try to do what I can to put it out there for people who may not understand addiction. Um, Addiction isn't necessarily uh, a weakness. Um, No, no. It's a, listen, I'm going to tell you this. (laughs) Drugs, especially the the powerful ones, you get up there, your heroin, your um, cocaine, your uh, methamphetamine, these things, it don't matter who you are, okay? You do it, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. I'm just, that's just anybody. It doesn't matter how mentally tough you are. It doesn't, your body is not made to feel the things going on. So when it hits, it's like, oh, yeah. It, it, you're, you're helpless against yeah. it. And, exactly. Um, that's why it's best to never do it. You can't miss what you don't know. And it's really best never to try that stuff. So when somebody says, hey, you want to try this line? You want to smoke this bowl? You want to, you know, do this shot? And just say no, because I'm here to tell you, it could be years before you get yourself back. Yeah. Well, if it, you come back at all. Exactly. If you if you come back at all, um, I'm I'm glad that you're willing to talk about this because a lot of people aren't, um, uh, and I understand yeah. that, and that's everyone's choice whether or not they want to talk about it or not. But for anybody listening out there, my my feeling is. Um, that if you can talk about it, if you're able to talk about it, then please do so because you never know the effect of your words when you give your account of how you were affected by addiction, uh, when you give your account of how you overcame uh, addiction. You never know the positive work that your story can do. So, uh, So thank you for sharing that part of your story, Rob. Thank you so much. You're welcome. A lot of... You know, a lot of people go through things and, you know, they, they could be ashamed. And, it, and it's shameful. Yeah. It, it's shameful. The the person you are when you're high on, you know, high stimulants and the the, the, the precedents and, you know, the ups and downs, you make choices you wouldn't make normally. You may, you know, be with people you wouldn't normally hang around with. You know, your parents look at you and they don't see their child. They see yeah something else, yeah. you know. Yeah. Your eyes are empty. There's no soul. There's no... and um, it's embarrassing. It's shameful. It's all of that. So that's just on by yourself. Yeah. You feel those things. So I could, I can only relate to someone who's like, I don't want to get in front of a bunch of people and have a bunch of people looking at me. Like right. That. Right. So, right. But hey, I've come to terms with it. It's a part of my life. Yeah. And, well, uh, and it's a, a part of, of your strength. They don't talk about, and sometimes they need, yeah, they need people to tell them, you know, yeah. someone's sitting at home right now struggling with something and doesn't know where to go or doesn't think someone else has also struggled with that. And it's like, you can see me and look at the smile and think I've never been through nothing in my life. I've really been through the most. And, and, the, worst, and, and the, the importance and, the, and the, the value in your story is this. It's that you can come out on the other side of this a better person and live a better life. Because some people in the midst of addiction or some family members who, are, who have a son, daughter, or family mm-hmm. member who is an addict, they yeah. give up on any thoughts of things being normal or being better for that person who's suffering yeah. from addiction. And you're they a testament. Do. You are a testament to that. Yes, it does happen that way, but it also happens this way. Look at you. Look at Rob. You know, um, there yeah. is hope. You know, you are you. You're an inspiration. You're a motivation. You're a blessing for people who are walking through. Uh, all the muck in the in the mire of of, of addiction. You you are a, you're a shining light, and uh, if oh, o- if only you. well you are you are. And if only one person, if only one person hears the last you know ten minutes of us talking, and if that's the only part of this podcast they listen to, it might save them. It might save somebody for hearing that. So so again, th- th- thank you so much. Yeah, well, yeah, it's different. It's different when. It, it, it does. It hits different when you have someone who's never been through a struggle, never done a drug, never did anything, and they're telling you that you need to stop. You yeah. need to do this. You need right. to do that. And they have right. no idea. I mean, if everyone could stop doing heroin and coke and meth, they would. Trust sure. me. It's really hard. You know, and that's why I say don't even start because you yeah. don't even know how hard it's going to be to get off. And however because great feeling you feel in the beginning, it's just. People, I, I get I, I get upset. There's a lot of parents out there who say, you know, well, I'm going to let my child experiment with this, that, and the other. And uh, the thing is, the thing is, is an experiment is a passing thing. Wow. An experiment is something that you're supposed to, it's supposed to happen and then it's done. But 
I don't think you yeah. can experiment with these heavy drugs like that because it's not you, you don't no. go in and, no. and get out. The, you know, if you have if you have the wrong chemistry in your brain, it's over with the smallest yeah. microdose. Your life as you knew it is over. So this thing about allowing yeah, kids like I was saying, I've seen a lot of good people, a lot of good people that I would say are good people and it affects them. It changes them. It does all of those things. And, uh, some, like some people, they don't make it back. You know, I, I can, yeah. I, as I sit here and I look at the, the ocean, the Aegean sea, the, the, the Mediterranean, I'm in Greece. And I just think about all the people that I ever was with in a drug house doing drugs and they'll never get to see this because they, 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 they never make it out. You know, and yeah. And like, I wish I could save them all, but, that's yeah, but you know what? Again, if 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 that one person hears just a couple of minutes of what we've been talking about, it can it can change lives. It can be a life changing experience to hear your account of of uh, your account and your experience, and and then see your success coming out on the other side of that. But one thing I want to ask you then, okay, so you you've yeah. gone through, and, and I almost literally have to shake my head to get because I get real emotional when I talk about what happened with my son, and I'm feeling very inspired hearing you talk about your story. Oh. But just to take a step to the side of that and 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 go into something else, you're you're living this blessed life. You're living this life where you're having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You know, the smile is on your face now. Um, yeah. The first place you traveled to, am I correct that it was it was to Norway? You came to Norway first. Well, so you know my travel history is, uh, you know I played college football at uh, Santa Monica College, and when I was eighteen, we used to go to Mexico, go to TJ, to Tijuana, and uh, you know go drinking and stuff. You know, with eighteen in Mexico, as long as you can see over the bar, they're gonna serve you, and uh, we would have fun and. Um, and then uh, I've been to Canada, and then I went. My a friend of mine had a wedding. Uh, my friend Marcus had a wedding in uh, 2017, and it was the Dominican Republic. And he wanted me to be a groomsman. He grew up when we grew up together in Herndon, in Virginia, and so that was that. But then, like, I went to Norway. It was it was really weird because I was dating a, a wonderful woman named Sharon. She was just she is just. Uh, like the love of my life. I tell you what, I'm not with her today, but it's a whole case of the universe giving you everything you could ever want yeah. and you not being ready to receive it because, oh man, I dropped the ball. I fumbled a big time on oh, that one. Man. But, um, she was, uh, she is. Yeah. 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 I know. It's heartbreaking the story too, right? It's got everything. Hey, listen, we got ups, we got downs, we got drugs, we got sports, we got movies, we got fishing, <laughs> we got heartbreak. We got it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh, Oh, so anyway, she is Norwegian American, okay. American Norwegian. Her family is Norwegian, and uh, so a lot of things came together. Uh, we were dating. She'd never been anywhere outside the United States, and I wanted. There was uh, a desire to show her and experience for myself Norway, Norwegian roots. There was. Um, we were uh, having a, a kid. We were gonna have a kid, and um, our baby dies. It was like, oh, I'm oh, sorry, man, like. I, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's all right. Uh, and um, it was, you know, it was like you. Uh, it's just like I had a perfect woman, perfect life for the baby coming on the way and everything like that. And uh, that time period, I went through a really deep depression. And uh, I just like opened up the doors to bring in all the substances, all the bad people I'd ever deleted off Facebook. I'm adding them back. Let's hang out. Let's do this. Yeah. And, uh, at a time period where, you know, this is how I feel as a man. And the woman, she's the one carrying the child. How does she feel? How does and she feel, yeah. If I'm just depressed, you know, and this is a time where this was an opportunity. This was a, a moment for me to step up and become a man that I should have been and um, the man that she needed me to be. And I couldn't even be a man for myself. And so I fell apart and, uh, you know, I, mean, I look up six months later, you know, girl's gone, job gone, everything's oh, gone. And I'm wow. just right back to where I, like where I was. And it was, it was terrible. And so I was thinking, you know, I wanted to go to Nori with her. I wanted to, you know, do this experience, all this stuff with her. And I don't even have her, you know? So man, and I was like looking, I Googled, it was 2017. I Googled, I was so like, <laughs> I was so sad. I was so just, 
done with life. And I was like, Google, where is the happiest country in the world? And that year, Dang. it was Norway. Yeah. All right. This is this is a true story. This is crazy. And so I was just like, you know, to me, I'm like, you know, if I'm <laughs> if I'm sad, I want to go be happy. I'm gonna go to the happy. It just made sense, right? Right. I was like, right. Okay. Um, so I because I'm thinking it, it literally can't be worse than what my life is right now. And um, so that was like the Norwegian beginnings was because of Sharon, and then. Being, trying to be happy was also coming in. And then I started doing more research about Norway, about, you know, the, the crime rates are really low, safety's high, uh, health care is, is taken care of, your uh, education to all public universities is free through your master's degree. And I just started thinking, like, you know, if this is a country where there's a lot of goodness going on, I'm trying to rub shoulders with the goodness and hopefully it rubs off on me. Right. And uh, um, so, yeah, I, I wanted to go. But the problem is, I didn't have any money. You know, I just spent six months trying to kill myself. <laughs> <And> <laughs> spending all my money on drugs is just ridiculousness. So um, I was like, well, I saw, <laughs> this is so weird. I saw an ad on Craigslist for Goodwill job searching, and it was about this cannery in uh, Dutch Harbor, Alaska. Okay. It was, it was a cannery. It was a horrible job, okay? It was a horrible job. But I was excited to do it because, Literally anything was better than the life I was living at that time. Like they were even kind of like really weird, weirded out by me. They're like, "You do realize that this job like kind of sucks. Like you seem to be really happy for someone to do this job. I, I just want to make sure you know it's gonna <laughs> suck." <laughs> and I was just like, "Man, you know, I used to be over there, yeah, and it was all bad. So if I go over there, it can only be better." So um, that's a great outlook. Up there. That's a great outlook. Now I'm in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and yeah, the job did suck. Yeah, I mean, straight up. I mean, that's just facts. So uh, I'm in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and uh, I'm working at this company. Right? I'm in this rain gear shoulder to shoulder with somebody. I got tweezers, and I'm picking up parasites from fish coming on a conveyor oh, belt man. for 12 hours a day. You know, or crab come in. I pick it up. I kill <sighs> it on this, like, fitting thing. and, and put it, It's the worst, right? Man. And so this is what I, when you were saying about making the right choices, life starts kind of opening up for you and a path will become clear because there was no Wi-Fi on Alaska Island, which is where Dutch Harbor is. There's no Wi-Fi, right? So, and if you buy something from AT&T, it's like $25 for a gigabyte of data. It's a big scam and rip off. And um, there was a bar. There was one bar there. There's only two on the whole island, but there's a bar. And they even say for $5, you can have Wi-Fi. You know, we'll give you the code to have Wi-Fi here for 24 hours. This bar is named the Norwegian Rat Saloon. Oh, the Norwegian Rat on, Saloon. <laughs> you kidding me right now? Are you kidding me right now? I just, when you see that, you'll be like, <laughs> hold on, man. What's happening right now? Right, so, right. I go to this bar, and um, I'm trying to download some uh, videos from YouTube so I could keep them on my computer and go watch them in the dorm or whatever they have set up for it. And, uh, a, de uh, a deck wash and a first mate from a boat, the FV Aleutian Sable. They walk into this bar. The season starts tomorrow. A guy has just quit for whatever reason. I actually met that guy later, and I thanked him, too, because he didn't quit. I couldn't have a job. It was really, it was a small island. Um, and they needed somebody. And they come to the bar to look for somebody. And somebody told me, like, I was like, man, how do you make money in this place? Because this ain't it. The picking the parasites out of this fish. This is not going to get me to Norway. No, no. And somebody said, you got to get a job on a boat. Listen, I've never, to this day, to this day, I've never seen Deadliest Catch. And now I don't need to see it. I've done it. You've lived it. Uh, if I had seen it, I probably would not have got on that boat. Let me tell you. Uh, and, oh, my goodness. And so they come to me. I go to them. I'm like, look, I heard you guys need somebody on their boat. They look at me. They're like, just looking at me like, you know, you, have you ever been on a boat? <laughs> You got experience? And I'm like, e I mean, e no. <laughs> you know, um, okay, well, do you have any gear? So define gear. Define like, what gear. exactly is gear? <laughs> and they're like, oh, my goodness. Like, who is this guy? <laughs> I'm like, listen, I've been living the worst life, and I'm trying to live my best life. If, you know, if I don't need a purse, like a specialized skill, if it's just hard work, I can do it. I can do it. You know what I mean? And um, so they say, okay, look, all right, whatever. 
Season starts tomorrow. We got to sell out. With it. I know they're thinking they're going to run me into the ground on the first trip. I'm going to quit, and then they'll find a qualified uh, fisherman. They don't know me. They don't know what's in here, though. So they're like, all right. All right, we'll take you. You, you can go. You can come up. And I'm like, oh, like right now? Like right now? Oh, um, who? Uh, you know, um, can, I, I, can I make a phone call? Or you need to call your mommy? Oh, I mean, oh, just like, it's just, <laughs> just like an older woman in my family who cares about me a lot. I mean, some people can refer to her as my mother. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, she kind of likes to know when I'm in life threatening situations, if I'm going to right, die. Right. Right. <laughs> right. One, so one would think that. one would think. <laughs> right. But I didn't have any service. And the guy was like, look, and remember, I got flown to that island by another company so i'm like okay so just grab my backpack i can't tell the company that i'm leaving i can't call my mug listen commercial fishing in the Bering sea is one of the most dangerous jobs on this earth yes it is and i'm just like well i grab my backpack i put my coat on all right let's go and uh they took me across the street the norwegian rat saloon right across the street as alaska ship supply and you know i'm like wait wait, whoa I, I i don't have any money to be buying all this stuff <laughs> And they're like, listen, man, the boat, we charge it to the boat. We take it out of your pay. God, this guy is the greenest guy we've ever seen in our life. We might as well be it's ridiculous, right? So I'm like, all right. They spend, it was like $1,500 just buying, like, you know, I had to get uh, another pair of extra tough boots. I had to get real rain gear, not the stiffy right, stuff that I had. Yeah. Enough. You know, I had to buy rain gear you could move with. Yeah. And by the end, when they're checking out, and I'm like, yo, these guys just spent fifteen hundred dollars on me. This is real. Like I now owe them fifteen hundred dollars. Like this is gonna be something. I can imagine. Yeah, I, I can imagine your brain. Business. I can imagine your brain just being tied up in a knot. I mean, for things to happen that quickly, to go from the point I where mean, you're asking them was, about this to where they're now buying your equipment so you can go out the next day on the boat. This was thirty minutes. Wow. Yeah, thirty minutes. Thirty minutes from them walking in to me seeing them. Like, who are those guys? And to, to them take me to the store, you know, I'm thinking I'm, <laughs> this is a job I've never done, people I've never met, a boat I've never seen. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> that's, that's just, that's absolutely insane. Norway. Yeah, I wanted to get to Norway. What kind of, what kind of pay? And the universe provided me with this opportunity. What kind of pay does a person make doing that? Isn't it all dependent on how much, how big the catch is? It's not like they give you a set salary, is it? Uh, some boats, I think, do have set salaries, but oh, okay. I can't really speak for that. I don't know. I can only, you know, guess, just like you as well. Uh, my boat was a boat where you got uh, you got percentages, and I was a greenhorn, and I was the lowest guy on the boat. I got the lowest percentage. I ended up getting like 2% of the catch. We caught, over the season, a season, we caught – um, 1.2 million pounds of Alaskan cod, and I got two percent of that. But if you know, if you had experience, you can get two and a half percent, three percent, four percent. Okay, yeah. you know, so it's a sliding scale. But I mean, I, I was. It ended up working out in my favor very beneficially. Let me tell you, I, I can I can because say that. because of the money you made. Definitely, the money I made. You know, I look at it like the people that stayed at that job, and it was just random. Because they told me, they were like, if you don't take this job and give us an answer, like in the next few seconds, every every single person that works at that place where you're working, picking parasites, wants this job. People literally fly to Dutch Harbor with no job and just walk the dock asking for jobs, hoping. And if they don't get a job, they fly I, back home. I was thinking and about that. Because, I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I was thinking about that because I've kind of read up on that because that's a fascinating lifestyle to be out on those fishing boats out there. And I've read that people will, yeah. um, especially, when was this? This was Like around, you know, two, when, when the housing crisis hit the States, like two, 2006, 7, 8, 9, in those years there, yeah. liter, literally thousands of people were just flocking to the docks there in Alaska and literally, you know, pitching yeah. themselves right then and there to be, to be hands on these, on, on these boats. And it can change a person's life because of the money that can be made. Definitely. Without that, 
I would have never made it to Norway. At the end of the season, and I compared notes of you know, how much money I made on this boat and how much money the people made in that factory, wasn't even close. I would have never made enough money to be able to move to Norway at all. So, and so you you had the money to move I mean, to. It was just a blessing, like I said, right time, right place. So you had the money to move to Norway after just one season. Yep, after one season. Okay, so then. Um, yeah. So you, yeah. you you get to Norway and. If I remember right, you actually got a gig as an actor in some sort of film, or a, was it a TV series, and also on a commercial. How did that happen? Yeah. And that's crazy. So, you know, that whole thing, you know, everybody can say what they'll do when they get a bunch of money. You know, I'll do this, I'll do that, yeah. I'll do this. But when you get that money, it is different. Because then you start thinking... Man, I should be like responsible, prudent, <laughs> practical. I have to pay some debts off. Maybe put a down payment on a home. Maybe do something responsible. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the Norwegian dream was like, man, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to do that. But again, this is my mom. My mom, God bless her. My mom was like, you worked your butt off on that boat, and you only went there because you were trying to make money to move to Norway. You yeah. got the money. That's now you've got to go off. do it. I, yeah. You, you need to go. Yeah. Because you'll regret it if you don't. Yeah. So I went, I stopped in Amsterdam first. That was the first little stop. I didn't stop there to smoke weed. Weed <laughs> is legal in Oregon. I don't have to go to Amsterdam to smoke weed. There you go. But I went to Amsterdam and it was fun. It was, it was amazing. And then I, I was in Amsterdam for a few days and then I, I got to Oslo. And I, <laughs> you know, I got a friend of mine, Ben, Ben Bryan. He's a personal trainer. He does everything in Oslo. He's a, a, a black American guy living in Norway. Um, living a very blessed life. And I ended up running into him. I met him out there, and I didn't know anything. Like, I just went. I didn't know what it took to get a visa. I didn't know how to – I didn't know anything. <laughs> I just showed up in this country yeah. with a su two suitcases and a check. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. Oh, my goodness, I don't recommend doing oh, it's that. Hard to get a, it's um, hard to catch a check over here in Norway. That's hard to do. <laughs> man, you know, so I'm just like – I don't have the answers, but I have this money, and I can figure it out. It buys me time to figure it out. Because Ben was like, oh, you got a job offer? You got a contract? You got a place to stay? You got this and that? And I'm like, no. None no, of the above. Of <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> so he's like, can you just show up? You got friends here? Have you ever been to Norway? You ever been to Europe? Like, and I'm like, no. No. <laughs> so you just hmm, had a thought in your mind about this country being great, and you just wanted to go, so you just went. So yeah. so so when yeah. you landed here, where did you where did you stay that first night? Did you just get a hotel somewhere, or? Uh, I stayed I stayed in a hostel, and then I had met I had met some people uh, online, and okay. uh, like kind of like host like you know hosting uh, Airbnb, you know, and um, so I I was staying at this place in Torshof, and uh, the woman there uh, it was it was uh, her and her son, and they really took me under their wing. Her name was Heidi. And her, uh, she had a son, pardon me. And Jimmy, she really is the one, you know, showing me the neighborhood, yeah. you know, helping me out with my directions. You'll learn the neighborhood 500 meters at a time by walking, and you'll start to learn the, the metric system yeah. by experiencing, like, it takes me this amount of time to walk this far. So that's 500 meters. This is a kilometer. This is, you know, so she was really helping me out, trying to, you know, help me with my Norwegian and everything and bless her heart she i mean i, I was in the top bunk it was like yeah top, i was on the top bunk of the bunk bed <laughs> big dude um so yeah it was that and then i, I went i met where was I? I was in Storgata. i was in Storgata, uh the bars and stuff down there in oslo and i, I met someone and uh, she's a singer and she was like you know you have a great personality have you ever thought about acting and i'm like i mean I did a little bit of things in Hollywood when I was 18. I went to the Baron Brown Actors Studio. I was a Stephen Wonder Music video, did some different oh, wow. things. But, like, yeah. you don't leave Hollywood to start acting. Like, I, the right. Hollywood dreams is, is gone. Right, like, not, right. Man, you know, what, how much stuff I've been in since Hollywood. Like, I've been <laughs> jail, prison, drug, all kinds of fishing. I didn't think about yeah. no movies. What are you talking yeah. about? Um, so I'm, like, acting. I mean, I don't even speak Norwegian. It's like, you don't have to. I was like, well, don't you? This is Norway. And, uh she was telling me like everything is done on like Facebook groups and uh, there is a, there is a website that you can go to. You cost money for a membership, but seriously, like the Facebook groups really got all the, the casting because it's just the casting directors directly to you. Yeah. There's not real yeah. agents and managers. Nope. So 
it was just very random. I just, I saw this ad is from Maxim Norga, uh, the hunky peanut. Like, you are a hunky, and so am I, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yo, for real, like, so tasty, it's motivating. Yeah. And let me tell you, those bars are really good. Are they- you see the you see the hunky peanut bar in the store. <laughs> Yeah, Try it out. Uh, Raymond Tucson, you need to go ahead and Give pick it a one of those up. Give it a shot. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And uh, it's good, for real. And it's not just because it's me. It really is good. I'll eat it anyway. Um, and so I just auditioned. You know, it's weird because I'm sitting in my – at the time, I, I had moved out from Heidi's place, and I had my own apartment in Cabana. And I was on uh, the, the ninth floor overlooking, like, the Oslo Fjord and everything. And I did a self-tape with my phone, and I just did a self-tape. And I, I just auditioned right into my phone. I ended up sending it out to, um, it was Yellow Banana, Yellow Banana Production Company in Oslo. And they, they were uh, doing and working with Maxim and Orkla, uh, Orkla, the parent company of Maxim. And so they liked me and they had pitched an idea where they wanted to have Norwegian actors and actresses um, struggling and physical, physical, like, you know, push ups, pull ups, bench press. And they wanted Americans, like an American actor, to be, you know, their. Uh, translated across his fantasy friend, but it's it's, it's it's imaginary friend, like imaginary person. Right. You know, when you're struggling, yeah, yeah, you, someone needs to be there. Like, come right. on, bro, you yeah. can do this. Yeah. You know, and yeah, that was me. And um, I didn't really have any idea about how big it would be. I just went and did it. And there was three. There was the hunky peanut bar, the chocolate hero bar, and the freaky caramel bar. And they when they presented all three commercials um, to Maxim. Maxim just happened to like mine the most. Okay. So Maxim put the big push behind mine. And so mine was the one you saw uh, on YouTube or Snapchat ads, Instagram, uh, in the cinema. Like I went to the cinema and it was like, I, man, I'm on a movie screen in Norway. I'm a black American. This is crazy. That has you know, to be kind of. Like that has to be kind of mind blowing. Man. <laughs> Mind blowing. Like you walk down the street, you know, like, oh, you're the hunky peanut guy. No, Norwegians ain't really like that. You know, they might notice, they might, they won't come up and talk to you. But every now and then, somebody, every once in a while. you see somebody staring at you a little bit too hard. That's why. Yeah. 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 So that was, a, so that was you kind of getting your feet wet then in the, in the filming yeah. industry. What, and then what happened after that? Didn't you get another, you got another yeah, opportunity? Then, yeah. Then from that, from that, right, so, you know, I, I was, I had another commercial was for the lottery, right? But this is before the Maxim commercial has been released. I, and I don't really know how big it's going to be. So I had taken a role <laughs> in this other commercial that was not something you wanted to have done when you have a big commercial coming out, oh, right? Yeah. It was this lottery commercial. It was a, a, <laughs> it was a Halloween costume party. And it was just two avocados. <laughs> it was like the male avocado with the 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 pit, and then the female. And yo, oh. look, nothing. People did that role, and they did a great job. But it's just like the casting director, Ellie, <laughs> Ellie, Ellie Beck. She was like, "Yo, maybe you don't want to do that when you have a big commercial coming out, right?" Right. And I didn't even think about it because I was like. I don't know. The avocados pay more money than the other roles. I, I oh, mean, did it? You know, what okay. can I do? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, see, see, she gave me a different role, and I'm just in the background. You ever see that commercial? Like, oh, you can't, I'm just there for like a second. You can't see that. So then after that, I got this movie, right? Right. It's a short film by Daniel Anda. Uh, it was called Sandbox, and it's won a few awards, a few independent uh, film festival awards and short film awards. It's a really great film, great director, great cast. My man Tord, he's uh, he stars in some some TV show on NRK. Oh man, I apologize, Tord. I don't know the name, but Tord's a big deal. Tord's the man. So it's me and Tord, and uh, it's just a short film. It's called Sandbox. It's on my website, robdoesitall.com. You can see like I have a show reel with some of it in there. But we did that. I'm gonna link. I'm gonna link to your website, by the way, so people can go in and find out everything about you. And just a little side note to anybody watching or listening, you've got to check out Rob's blog. It's quite entertaining, quite motivational. Yeah. So, yeah, continue, please. Yeah. Yeah, that blog's been read in over 100 countries. That's what's up. I love it. Um, I love it. So that movie, that movie was awesome. That was a great experience. And, and again, that was a short film. I actually, 
I actually just did that film. I didn't get paid for that film. Nothing. Okay. I just got. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I just did it. Was it I, an I independent? It uh, and, was it was it an independently shot film, or was it under a media house? It, uh, it was mostly independent. Daniel did a lot of it on his own. He had a little bit of help from some different people, but I would say it was mostly on his own. Okay. Uh, and so, like, basically, I was like, yo, can I at least keep my characters clothes? I want something. <laughs> I, get, I get, you know, throw coast, breakfast, yeah, lunch, and dinner. I, I need clothes, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get to keep the characters clothes. That was cool. And I had no idea, like, Daniel's a very talented director. So um, that film went off, and it started winning awards and doing good stuff, but then the pandemic hit and everything, right. so it probably didn't get the, the light and shine that it really should have. And I think it might even still have one more film festival this year coming out. And then um, then I did another one. I did another film called Sopel, which is Norwegian for trash. <laughs> the film is not trash, though. Um, it's about a, a trash exhibit and an art. Uh, the director is Jay. She's amazing. Um, we worked on that. Oh, where was that? It was in Oslo as well. And, you know, that film was really cool. Uh, one of the guys in that film, now he stars. Oh, man, I should have been more prepared for this because he stars in a TV show in Norway now, and he plays the father of the main character. Uh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> but anyway, I apologize. I'm like the worst. No, I'll, I'll link to it. They're gonna cool. they'll, they'll they'll get their props because I'm gonna link to these films when I post this episode so people can go in and see it. So they'll get their props. They will. And, and everybody will have their first and last names there, and exactly. everybody gets yeah. their props. Yeah. I apologize. I don't want to butcher anybody's name for pronunciation, <laughs> but look, they know I know, and we're gonna make sure that you. But know. you, but you got <laughs> so you got a lot done in a very short time in Norway because all of this happened over the course of what a, a year, right? Yeah, less than that even. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you. What's that? So you are. What is that happening right now? I'm cool. I can see you and hear you. You there? Okay, hold on. I just like something happening with like. Oh. Hold on. Don't hang I'm up. Something in my. Don't hang up though, because I'll lose wait. everything. No, no. Ah. What okay. happened? I don't know. ESPN.com was in another window. And oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was hearing <laughs> highlights. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you got ESPN over there, John? What you doing, man? You up my interview. Really, I'm messing up your interview. And I apologize. Hey, you know what? There's no such thing as messing up my interview. I've had the strangest things happen. I've had my wife come in through the door to tell me it's time to eat, and that's been on the episode. I've had my kids come in <laughs> asking me. Yeah, so interruptions are par for the course on this on this podcast here. This is nothing. Awesome. But, but, but yeah, you, so I did. I got a lot done. And it, it just, like, I can't explain it how, like, I would say, Yair and Spart Viking. Like, I am a black I Viking. A black it's just Viking. something that's in me. I don't know what it is. I felt like I wanted to get to Norway. When I got there, it felt like home. I can't understand. Like, it felt like home. The air was better. The, the water was better. And things started happening. They were just and like, the thing, the thing me, is. The thing is, is sometimes when you are pushed or pulled into a certain course of action, it's not always explainable. You know, I, I never, I've been here 19 years now and I still can't believe I'm here. It was not planned. It just kind of happened through a set of circumstances. And all of a sudden I'm here in Norway and I can't, you know, I can't get my head around that still because it's still so exciting. Yeah. It's still so much yeah. of an adventure. There's still things to learn. I learned something new constantly here. So that's that 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 sense of adventure, that sent that fairy tale sense about Norway is still present yeah. present for me after nineteen years. It's amazing. No, and I and I love it. I mean it could have been, you know, a lot of times you might have something going on in your mind a dream or fantasy or whatever. And when you experience that, it's not the same. Right. I couldn't know, I could not know what to expect. I've never been to Europe, never been to Scandinavia, never been across the pond. So I don't know. I'm taking my entire life savings and I'm risking it on a dream that I've had. And it was just wonderful. Like me personally, I love Norwegian culture. I love the people. I love the country. I love everything about it. Like this is where I wanted to be. This is where I want to be even right now to this day. If somebody gave me a billion dollars that you can move anywhere in the world, I'll move to Norway. Yeah, Still, yeah, I have a big house, yeah. but I would still be in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, like, 
so how when did you get into bartending? Because now you're an instructor at the European Bartender yeah. School. When how did that come yeah. about? Well, <laughs> Norway had a big part to do with that too. So I always say that I bar I was a bartender and I was bartending before I came to European Bartender School. But European Bartender School taught me how to be a bartender. There's bartenders and then there's bartenders. Okay. And EBS taught me how to be a bartender. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, gosh, a lot of bad bartenders in the United States. And there's a lot of people, for one, but it's just because anybody standing behind a bar can call themselves a bartender. Right. They may not know how to make a cocktail. They may not know anything. But you walk into a bar, somebody's behind the bar, yeah. hey, bartender. You know, hey, can you make me, uh, you know, uh, can you make me a clover club? And be like, I, I, I don't know, what is a Clover Club, you know? So just because you pour a drink doesn't make you a bartender. There's more to it than and, just uh, slinging the alcohol into a glass. There's more to it than that. Exactly. So what happened is uh, I had a job, and I was at uh, Sister Song Brugeri in Groenland in Oslo, and I got a contract from them. I had, um, you know... Uh, at first, I didn't wasn't getting paid enough. In the Norwegian government, I paid my six thousand six thousand kroner, right, for this application to get denied. That's six hundred okay, six hundred bucks to you, Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, and they were like, "You don't you don't get paid enough. In order for us to accept your visa, you have to make one hundred eighty kroner an hour." So I had a boss at the time, uh, Natalia. She was Polish. She was amazing. Like this is me. Like a lot of people were a part of my story and helping me get from one place to the, to the next. Like right. I had to do a lot of work with myself, but there was roadblocks and, you know, and Ty could have been like, Hey, I can pay this guy 150 kroner. Why did I pay you 180 kroner? Right. You know? And right. so she, she did that. She helped me. And then, um, the, but the Norwegian government, God bless the Norwegian government. It is very hard to get a visa to Norway and it for is. good reason, because this is really where you want to be. They don't need you. You need them. Yes. That's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they wanted some uh, certification. You know, like, okay, we see your CV. You've been bartending, but it doesn't tell us how good you are. It tells us how qualified you are. So, uh, you know, they, they were denying me. You know, I, I'm like, I have a job. I have a contract. I have everything. I'm working. Like, uh, okay. Um, hmm. Well, uh, okay. So I Google, Google, Google your friend, bruh. Google, what is the best? Bartending school in Europe. There you go. European bartender school. That, hey, that's what they I don't know. I'm not in Europe. I'm not from Europe. <laughs> I've never been in Europe. I don't know. I don't have any say in this. You know, I'm just right. like, just tell me whatever's the best because I want to have the the, cert, the certification, the certificate that holds the most weight. So when I have this certificate and I reapply for my visa, I want, you know. Make it undeniable. Uh, UCI, Make it undeniable. Yes. Right. Yeah. So. I want them to say, you know, okay, because, you know, how it's going to work is that essentially a business has to exhaust all their Norwegian prospects. Right. Before, before they go to a, to an, uh, a foreigner or an immigrant uh, for that job. Yeah. Right. For that visa. And yeah. as an American, it's even worse because Norway is like exhaust all your Norwegian applicants first and then exhaust all your European applicants second and then you know, maybe we'll take somebody from America. He better be good though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you wanted yeah, that. So, I, so you wanted that 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 uh, right? you want. So you wanted that certification then from the uh, European Bartender School to make your visa undeniable. Now, wh where is the bar, uh, European Bartender School located? Where's their headquarters? Well, there's. I mean, there's a lot of them. They have. You know, right now, you know, we're in Cost Greece. Yeah. EBS Cost. Uh, what up, Big L? Lawrence Apartments. Um, but they have, there's, I mean, they have an EBS Paris, EBS London. I went to EBS Dublin. Uh, they used to have one in Oslo, but it closed down. There's one in Copenhagen, okay. Malmo, Stockholm. Okay. So they're they all two in America, place. Miami and New York. They're everywhere, right? So it, it's literally like, it's the biggest and best bar team school in the whole world. And that was the serendipity, how that happened. And I called the number. And an American woman picked up the phone. Hey. I can't. <laughs> Unbelievable. Her name is Chelsea. She's from San Diego. She works for EBS. Uh, she's been promoted since because she's awesome. She works in uh, Spain. And, you know, she picked it up. She had such a great, like, hey, how's it going? You know, and I was like, oh, 
I need help. I, I, <laughs> I have, you know, I have, I'm living in Norway, but I, I try to get a job. I just, you need to save me. I need to go to the next <laughs> course to start. I don't care where it is. Just make sure it's taught in English and I'll go. And she was like, well, okay, the next one in English is in Dublin, Ireland. So I guess I'm going to Ireland now. Right. And then now how long is I'm the school? How long is the school? It's, it's a four week course. The international course is four weeks for the students. And it's really cool. It's all inclusive, you know, like, well, this one, you know, if you stay with the people, like for example, I went and I went to Dublin, I was staying at the Abbey court hostel and you know, there's 24 students. I'm the only American. Uh -huh. and, and right now I'm, I'm the only black American instructor they have. They have another American instructor. He's half Dutch. So he loves American. There you go. He can live in Europe. You know, I'm the all American really struggling out here in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> so he, he, yeah, he, yeah. he got that EU passport. He's, he's Gucci. Right. And so, um, it's four week course and, and really like it'll take you, like, I believe in, like, I'm really, really believe in EBS that you could go on day one and not even know what a bar spoon is. And when you graduate, you can go work behind a bar anywhere and be good, you know, be good. You're already better than the average American bartender for sure. Yeah. This is my own words from my own eyesight. And um, so I, you know, I went and did the course and man, it was so, it was fun. It was challenging. It was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be out there. I'm just trying to get the certificate and get back to Norway. I'm working at a brigadier. Like, I don't, you know, I don't need to know all the crazy <laughs> stuff, but you know, uh, it was, it was cool. And it was awesome. I was in Dublin with like the best people. And I'm like hanging out with people is from Paris. Yeah. He's from, you know, Romania, Brazil. I've never been in a situation where I'm living with people in Germany as, you know, a taste of every place was, around the world. Yeah. It was so amazing. And it was so much fun and you get to make cocktails and, but it's a lot of hard work too. Like a lot of hard work. Like right now there's a four week course going on uh, and it's about to end. So there's students here at the weekend, but there's students here and they're from all over the world. And you know, so we, this one, this school here in Greece has like a pool and basketball courts and all type of parties yeah. and stuff going on. But, it really teaches you about life because life, like the perfect cocktail, is about balance. So you have to, yeah. you know, work, study, fun, you know, you realize you can't eat all the time. Stuff is expensive. You got to go to the grocery store. You got to start cooking. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know? Let me so, ask you, let me ask that, you this. That led me on to the let, let me, let me ask you this now. Okay. What, what year was it then when you completed uh, your time at the European bartender school? What year was that? That was actually, that was a year and a half ago. It was a, it was the first course of 20, it was January, 2019. I, wait, no, January, 2020. Okay. That I went and did that. And, uh, so, so for four weeks there, and I was actually a part of the very last European Barcher school in Dublin. The Dublin school is on hiatus for now. I don't know if it's closed, you know, permanently or not, okay. but uh, it was just a blast so being there and I did a good job. And they asked, you know, if I wanted to do the instructor course. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to. How how did that happen? Where, uh, I mean, was was it immediately upon your education that you immediately started as an instructor, or was there a little bit of no, time? No, no. So it was a little bit of time because after that, the pandemic hit and everything canceled. St. Patrick's Day in Dublin. Cause yeah. I'm always in Ireland. I'll just go another time, right? Oh uh, <laughs> man. So I was really upset about that. I, I was looking forward to that. And um, I went to Paris and London. I was kind of hanging out. Then I went back to the States, and I was bartending for a little bit. You know, the bars would be open, and they'd be closed, yeah. and they'd be open. And, uh, yeah. You know, it was really weird back and forth. But uh, one of my instructors was just like, you know, your personality and everything, you could be a good fit as an instructor. You know, you should think about taking the instructor course. And then I just thought about it, and I started looking at uh, the school. It's like uh, barschool.net. It's a website. So I went and looked on it and just – I could see that as an instructor, you could travel all yes. around. Yeah. You could go to the Paris school, then Cape Town, South Africa, Sydney, Australia. So I'm like, man, you know, if my Norwegian dreams seem to be dashed for the moment, how basically I was thinking, how can I become a better person and be a more skilled person? Cause I never went to university. Like I had knee surgeries and I stopped playing football in college, American football. And I didn't go back to school after that one. Force sports was over, school was over. Yeah. So, you know, I, you really feel like a loser. You try to apply for a visa to another country, you don't have a degree. Then you feel like, well, why, do, why do we want right, you? Then? Right, <laughs> exactly. Like, well, man, I'm really better in person <laughs> than I am on paper. <laughs> I promise you I am. I promise you. <laughs> you know? So it was all this stuff happening. So, I, you know, I do the, um, the, the student course, 
the mixology, two day mixology course, the online essentials, the tiki course, advanced bartending, uh, instructor course. Now I'm an instructor for, you know, so I really grew like a lot. And now I look back and it's like, all of it really made me better because it's like Norway was, you know, not saying no, it's just, they're saying make yourself How better. How do you get better to make, make them say yes? Make yourself more attractive to us. And you're like, okay, give me a minute. I'll do that. <laughs> right. You know, and it, it's been now, it's been almost two years um, since I left Norway. And now coming back, as soon as it opens up, I'm coming back. And uh, I, I got a couple of job offers. And so I have to go interview. And now my, now my CV is looking lovely. I'm telling you, please, UDI. Come <laughs> let me, on, man. Let me ask help you me this. Out, help me out, right? How did yes. you? But how did you end up then teaching there in Greece? Did you request to teach there? Or did they say this is where we have a class that we need? Will you come teach it? How did how does how did that work? Yeah, so like, so basically, you know, you get you get a, uh, like a, an, an invitation because the instructor course is invite only. Okay. So you get an invitation. Somebody's got to recommend you or something. You got you know, and the the boss Flo and uh, her boss Gavin. Uh, they're they're both amazing. So Flo is like, you know, send me your CV, write me a letter as to why you want to be a part of the Instructor Academy, why you want to do this course and everything. And, you know, uh, it's amazing. This is a great life. I'm teaching people actual life skills that they can take and become profitable over their entire right, life. Right. So I believe in everything about it. So I wrote her a letter and told her, you know, my story is just like what it means to me. And so you have to come out and you come out and you do the instructor course. You have to do the instructor course, you know, you have to know the way things are done. And okay. so that's, that's really what we were all here for. And we passed that. And then, it's, you know, now you have your certificate and then it's kind of like wherever they want to put you. So, you know, I'm here in Greece now. Yeah. But you could be, that could be wherever next time. Yeah. It could be New York City. They want in Brooklyn. It could be Stockholm. You know, it could be Spain. Man, I'm OK with all of and, that. And, and during know, all and during all of this, you're still holding on to that desire to live and work here in Norway. So that dream's not over yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. See, listen, if I don't know, I don't know if you've heard about my story, you know, Mr. John. Uh, <laughs> but Roblox, Roblox is not going to stop I me. Love I'm going to figure I love out a way I love to it. do it. I'm going to figure out a way to get better. Like, I've been studying Norwegian every day since I've been gone. Like, I'm just trying to be, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So I'm just like trying to be there and trying to be, I can tell that with, with that? you with you having the personality that you have, with you having gone through, I mean, you've walked every step of a very challenging path. You're going to yeah. live and work in Norway eventually. It's going to happen. So, Man, I just, it's gonna happen. just try to become better, be better, yeah. be better. Make it so they can't say no. I mean, they can always say no, but make it so that like, if they say no, it's like, oh, well, you crazy? Like, become, this, this guy is really an asset, not only. Become undeniable. Yes, because. I want to be an asset to, you know, not only the company, the bar, the, the, the business. I want to be asset to the Norwegian country itself. You know, yeah. my goal is to get the permanent residence visa, to become a citizen, to be like, this is my goal. I'm trying, yeah. I'm shopping for boot nods and everything, man. You're going to see me out there, <laughs> I love man. it, yeah. I would be, I would be well, shooting a booty to my boot nods. You would be a great asset to Norway uh, with your positivity and your desire to be of service. And here in Norway, you know it already, uh, there's so many opportunities. You know, Norway is, it, it, it's, in, in many ways, it's a difficult place to live. But if you can overcome the difficulty, it will very quickly become uh, th those difficulties will be will become uh, assets, will become benefits because you have to adapt. You have to be stronger. You've got to be quick mentally to navigate through. In in your case, the bureaucracy of Norway, that takes some brain power to navigate your way through. It takes heart to stick to your guns and have your motivation to continue on that path. So Norway can bring the best out of a person. I've seen it break a lot of American expats. I've seen them get broken by Norway, but I've also seen some of us rise to the occasion and, and, uh, and, and make it work. Like I say, turn those, turn those, those distractions or those difficulties into points of focus and into assets. And it looks like you are that kind of person. That's exactly what you're going to do. And you're going to become a better person because of it. And, and Norway's going to become a better place when you start living and working here. I'm trying, uh, you know, 
It's call like, call me John the Prophet. Wanna, John the Prophet says. John the Prophet. It's like, <laughs> why you wanna, why you want to come to Norway? Because in my opinion, this is my opinion, I determined Norway to be the best country in the world. That's what I thought. So, of course, I want. Why, why would I not? Would I want to be the second best, the third best, the tenth best? No, I want to go <laughs> to the best place because I want to live my best life. So I want to be in the best place. So, this is it hard yeah. to get into? The, of course, it. If it was easy, everyone would live in Norway, and everyone would be having yeah. a best life. It's, it is and a very, don't. it's a very difficult place it's to move Norwegian. to unless you have married a Norwegian. If, if you're coming on a work visa or some sort of a non-marital status, it is extremely difficult. So the people who make it through that really want to be here, and they really and truly become an asset to Norway. So that's that's you. That's you, Rob. This is years. This is years in the making. I, I've been. A very sick picture of my face, life and death. Oh my God, sea sickness! Like you wouldn't believe, I've done all of this. I mean, I have boots on my website. You can see there's a picture on my my extra tough boots on the on the left boot. It had on the back it said Virginia, and on the right one, is, I still have these boots. It said Norway. I wrote in permanent marker so that when I sat there, it was, this happened many times when I was overwhelmed and I was uh -huh. like, I don't know how I got on this boat. <laughs> the, 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 the sea is kicking my butt. I look down. I'm like, man, I want to quit. I want to quit. I want to quit. And when I look down. I see Virginia is where I'm from and Norway is where I'm trying to go. Wow. And it's like, it just keep me like going. Like this is, this yeah. is for real. Like I'm not, yeah. like, oh my, you can go right now and look at I it. I did you can see, see that. The pictures there. I did see that on your website. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. So it's like, you know, even my, my friends in Norway now are like, man, they're crazy. Like we're from Norway, you know, so we, whatever. But like, why do you want to be here so bad? I was like, Man, I've been through the hellfire, man, and I'm trying to get to the, to the goodness. Now you, you have you have such that. a compelling story and such a motivating story. I've said that so many times. And you told me on the phone you you are working on a book. Now is this a book about your life that you're writing, or is it a book where you're going to refer your story to another writer? How is how's this book project? Uh, going? No, I'm writing my book. You know, I'm not a huge celebrity. I'm not nobody. I've, I, first of all, I can't afford for somebody else to write my, my story. And you guys need to hear from me. This is my words. You know, the, the editor like is it. just making it into bookish. I but like it. This I is like, like it. the words. It's like how That's I you. speak. That's you. This is yeah. my story. So it's like, um, it was really weird. It started on Instagram. A lot of people that follow me were like, man, you know, you should write a book. And I'm like, a book? <laughs> man, who would read it? You know, like. Because my would. life's been so up and down. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> my life's been so up and down that it's like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing this stuff to write a book. You know, I wasn't going to jail. I was going to write a book. Like, you know, going through drug addiction, all this stuff. Some book could come out of it. I was trying to survive. You know, so I never think about writing a book. I'm just trying to survive and live. But you and see so now, on the other end. but you see now that that struggle just, ju and I put it in air quotes, just to survive, mm -hmm. that struggle is the story. That's what people will it, latch on to. And, and, and then it to is. make it, to make it even better, there's a positive result because you do come out the other side, a better person. And then the story is not over there because that new life that you're, that you're starting for yourself is quite exciting within itself. There's a lot of steps to it. There's a lot of facets and aspects and, and a literal journey. It's not just a mental concept of a journey, but you're on a literal journey in all of these countries that you visited. So you, you surely, you yeah. see the value of your story now, I'm sure. I, I see it now. Yeah. You know, when you're in it, you're not, you know, seeing, like, I never once felt inspirational to anybody. There's times I didn't feel inspirational myself, so I could never, I was too in it. To, right. to be thinking about stuff like that. And now I look back and I'm just like, okay, I met this guy who works for Columbia Sportswear Company, um, Dwayne, and he just, it was so, he was uh, he was telling me, he's the guy that was like, you should do a website, right? Because I'm like, he's like, you got a website? And I'm like, a website? Why would I have a website? <laughs> what would I put on it? Like, again, I don't know, you guys think I'm cooler than I am or something because I, I don't have no website. <laughs> right? And um, so he was like, do a website, start a blog, tell your story, like, and just be honest, you know, and people will, will latch onto that. And so, um, I did it. I have the blog, Rob does it all.com. I did the blog. I started doing it. I just started. So the first five is about my story of how I got to prison and things. I try to be truthful and honest about everything. And you know, sometimes in my stories, I'm the hero. Sometimes I'm the patsy. Sometimes I'm the winner. Sometimes I'm the loser. This is real. This is not just like 
I just win all the time. And my life is not like that. There's just so many, so, um, there's so many aspects to your life and to your journey. That's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it's book material. John, the prophet says again, that this will be a successful <laughs> book that it will sell in the thousands, yeah. if not the tens of thousands. And it's going to open even more doors for you, Robert. John, the prophet has spoken. <laughs> I, I sure hope so. And I titled it My Beautiful Nightmare. And I, love I like that title. I love it. It's fitting because I have lived a nightmare, but my life has also been and is very beautiful. Very beautiful. And it's just, you take the, the good with the bad, you roll with the punches. And life is what you make it. You know? How I many. Bad um, and my life is bad. How many blog entries do you have over how long of a period? How long has your blog been going and how many entries do you have? Mm, um, let's see. Um, I started my blog December, December 2019. I remember because it was right before, yeah, it was, I had it all going right before I went to EBS Dublin. So, let's see, I, you know, let's see, uh, 8, 9, 10, 20, 30, 40, <laughs> There's, I think there's 40, I don't know, 44. I didn't count exactly, but around 44 entries okay. on it right now. And I have another 15, 20 that I've started. <laughs> you know, sometimes ideas come, you know, I'll write a few sentences yeah, and then, yeah, I don't know, yeah. something happened, I eat dinner, you know. So but, you're uh, fairly productive. Yeah, so you're, I got all that stuff. So you're fairly productive then. You're putting out, what, two, what is that, maybe two or three entries per month, I would say. It, it, yeah, it was. It, it used to be a lot more, but then, like, I was coming here for an instructor academy and do this, you know, okay. I study yeah. that, and, you know, you got a job, I wake up, bartend, I go to the gym, you know, a lot of things, life happens, you know, I have a lot of time to do that, but I did last year, I found out, I didn't even know this, I was uh, one of the top 35 solo male travel blog websites and influencers in 2020. That's beautiful. I found that on Google myself. That is like, beautiful. Number 23, Rob Ventures, number 23, uh -huh. boom. I love it, right? man. I was going, I didn't even know about that. Like I was Googling for something else. And then I was like, Oh, what? <laughs> that is beautiful. Tell me <laughs> that's beautiful, man. See, and that Nobody even told me about it. And that, and, and I've only read, uh, and I told you this, I've only read one blog entry of yours and I deliberately stopped yeah. myself because I wanted that get to know you process to happen in real time on this microphone. Organically. But, but from yeah. that one entry, it told me that this is a brother that knows how to write. And then when you said you were, you were working on a book, I'm like, well, of course he is. You know, when you have a successful yeah. blog like that, it's, it's, it's the, it's the proving grounds to be a, uh, uh, an author in, in, in book format. Um, some people don't take yeah. blogs very seriously, but blogging is quite, and I should be ashamed of myself. I do all this communicating by my pod on, on my podcast and, uh, mm -hmm. I have a blog space on my website and I think I have what, three, four entries and that's it. I just don't do it. But at the same time, I call myself uh, a person who wants to write a book. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should start, yeah, well. maybe I should start filling in some space on my blog, on my website. You, you're doing it well. Yeah, write about anything. Exactly. Exactly. Right. If, whatever, think about it like this. There's, I don't know how many billion people on this planet, right? And this earth that if you like something or something interests you, it likely will interest someone else as well. Yeah. So, you know, like in the beginning, a lot of the stuff in the beginning and stuff is going in my book. So at, at some point I had to stop blogging about stuff that's yeah. going to be in my book. Yeah. Cause you ain't going to buy it if it's for free on my website. Right. Uh, I had to stop blogging about stuff like that. And then I just started shifting to like, you know, the, the five songs I'm listening to this week, you know, uh, why I'm traumatized by top ramen because I ate it for so long in prison, you know, like all this type of stuff. Like it's just, yeah. I don't know, dumb stuff. I don't, it's not dumb, but it's just stuff that I come up with. It's not, you know, um, well, it's entertaining. You know, Ramadan. Well, it's uh, not too long ago. Yeah, it's entertaining, and it's a it's a it's a it's a porthole yeah. into your soul, into who you are, into what occupies you, into your it's into your sense of humor. You know, it gives people an idea of who you are. It puts you out there. Yeah, you know, it puts your product yeah. out there. It's oh. a portal into everything else that you're doing. 
So there's the value of a blog. And here I am, and again, here I am saying these things, and I call myself yeah. a wannabe writer, but I'm not blogging, and that's ridiculous. I need to, I need to pick that up and start doing it. Listen, you've been in Norway 19 years, you said. You're literally living my dream right now as we speak. I want to be where you are right now. We switch. <laughs> if you even just wrote about that process yeah. and how that happened, how it came about, yeah. and your experiences, you would already have one person be like, oh, yeah. where, where, where are you going to write more? I need to know. There, there so, you go. And that's just on me. So and how that, many other people want to travel to another country, live somewhere else? You know, and, and that's the so, value you know. of that's the value of writing. Uh, all you need to do is reach one person, and that is a successful piece of writing. That's the way I look at it. You just need to reach one yeah. person. So, I'll write that I mean, book then. I, I'll, I would, I'll write that book. I'll sell one copy to you, and then I'll call it quits. I'm done. <laughs> man, maybe autograph. But I, I would like to know. I don't know about the rest of your 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 viewers, your listeners, but I would love to know. Maybe I have to go back and go to the beginning of your podcast. I would love to know how you got to Norway, how you, you know, created a successful podcast, how, you know, how, how you became Big John, you know, were, were you ever, were you always Big John? Did you look at John, he got big, like, I, I want to know, like, these are things I want to know. Inquiring minds want to Inquiring know. Inquiring minds want to know. I, actually, if you go back uh, to, what was it, two episodes ago, um, I had interviewed um, maybe three or four episodes back. I need to find it on my phone here, which episode it was. But I had interviewed a fellow stand-up comic here in Norway. And when I was done with that, mm -hmm. he talked to another friend of his and, and, and was talking about how they should figure out a way to interview me on my own podcast. Because here I am, I tell other people's yeah. stories, and I tell a little bit of my own story on my podcast. But he said people want to know who I am. So of course you're they, the man. This yeah, is your show. Well, so they approached me, and then we did that. I I gave my, my friend Eirik Eirik Sørvik. Uh, I turned the show over to him. He he took he took you know it's a coming home podcast with John Allen, but that day coming home podcast with Eirik Sørvik, and then I sat there. Oh, that's cool. As the guest, and he interviewed me, and I put it all out there, and the response since then kind of matches up mm -hmm. with what you're saying about how. Sometimes we don't know that our story can mean anything at all to anybody else because we're just living our life. But since I did that episode yeah. where I was the guest, now people are telling me they want more. And this goes right back to my thought. And my, my wife has been pushing me to write a book. And I told her, okay, I'm going to do it. about to say. Well, and I told her, okay, I'm going to do more. it. You mean like in the form of a book? <laughs> hmm. You know, so. I don't know. I don't know. But if you go, if you go back to episode um where is it here yeah episode 134 episode okay, 134 I will go back to that go back go back and check that one out and that'll tell you pretty much i mean there's a lot of holes in the stories but that'll tell you pretty much who i am and how i came to to land here in norway episode 134 so, so let me get this straight let me get this straight so you're telling me <laughs> That if I go to the Coming Home podcast with John Allen, episode 134, I can learn about the man, the myth, the legend himself. That's what you're telling me? Is that what I'm hearing? That's what you're hearing. That's what you're hearing. All right, then. I guess let it, let it, what has to be done. Let it echo throughout the land and say amen. That is what I'm telling you. So. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm going to check it out. Check it out, I'm gonna yeah. I'm going to be in Norway. I'm going to pull up on you. I'll be in Norway. You know, you never, I'll be here. I'm not too far. There. I'm not too far from Oslo. I'm in Drummen. So, man, next time you come back, you got to give me a holler. Drummen? I spent my birthday in Drummen two years ago. Ah. I got pictures. I was looking. I was right on the water because they have like a, 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 is it a, a sugar factory, a beer factory, something. It, it lights up on the water. And Dramen. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, across from Osbrigidi, yeah? Yes, yes, yeah. that. Because I, I remember because my birthday is June 5th, right? So I was just like, man, it was like 2 in the morning. It's still like semi-sunny yeah. outside. I'm in Dramen. Yeah, well, I don't know. Like maybe I've grown and matured, but to me, Dramen is lit. Like I think it's cool. It's, well, it's quiet. I'll it's tell just, you this. Now, I'm not a cool. city person. I'm, I, I, I'm born and raised out in the country in Ohio. I don't like cities. Okay. I don't like cities at all. But if I have to live in a city in Norway, I am so glad it's Drummond. Drummond is so charming. Uh, Drummond is so, yeah. uh, it's, it's a beautiful city. It's charming. There's a lot of good people here. And okay, 
I lost that battle with my wife. She's a lot tougher than me. She wanted to live in a city, so here we are. And I'm glad yeah. I'm glad it's Drummond. It's my favorite city. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I've been Drummond. I've been there. Yeah, Drummond's cool. I, I was in Drummond. And, and it's, it's less expensive than Oslo. And it's just That's a, true. That's true. Right away, you know? Listen, yeah. Rob, right Rob let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question as, as we wind this up. Um, yes, I, first of all, I want, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your story. And again, to anybody who's out there listening or watching, uh, I want them, I want you all to check out Rob's website, uh, check out his blog. Um, you know, I want to lift you up brother, because lifting you, you up is going to make it easier for you to lift up others. You see how that goes that around? Is, I'm that's, that's, that's my way of thinking. So anybody out there, I want you all to check out Rob's website, which is? RobDoesItAll.com. RobDoesItAll.com. I want you to check him out at RobDoesItAll.com. Uh, I want you to look in the description of this episode. You'll see his website. You'll see a couple of other links to some of the movies. And uh, hopefully I can find the commercials that he's been in. You'll also be able to find a couple of links where you can click on in order to support me. Uh, in the work that I'm doing on the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. So, Rob, to close this out, I want to ask you two questions. First question, I'm going to say it, and I want you to fill in the blank. Yes. Rob Yarber is? Okay. Fill in the blank. <sighs> hmm. I would say Rob Yarber is hope personified. Wow. If hope was a person, wow. I think it's me because if you don't have hope in your life, you don't have anything. You know, uh, I heard a long time ago, someone needs three things in their life, something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. And that has a lot to do with hope because I came from the bottom. I came from nothing, you know, yeah. not because of anything in my eyes. Those are my choices. I put myself at the bottom and then had to bring myself back up and, I just want others to know, you know, you could do it too. You could think I'm sitting in a prison cell right now. I'll never get out. I'll never do anything. I'll never see the world. I can never travel. Those are lies. Anything you do, if you got good vibes, you start seeing stuff work out for you. I can't explain it. Hope personified. I love it. Thank you for that. Now, yep. the last thing to close it out. Um, I want to ask you, Rob, can you give me and my viewers and listeners one sentence that they can carry with them after they've watched this or heard this one sentence that they can carry with them for motivation, for inspiration. Give me one sentence. Hmm. You can really do anything you put your mind to. Is, isn't that yeah. enough right there? You can really do anything you put your mind to period. I love it. Mm -hmm. Rob, I want you to know too. I've been braving mosquitoes i've been watching that know. i've been seeing you little little swatting it <laughs> oh my goodness oh, man. Man, you have no idea look I'm what you went through look what you went through for, for me. you big job i'm only doing it you went through this for oh, me my man goodness. I... well listen rob I, I i i i i absolutely love you i i love the story and what it's done i love you for your story and what it has done for me in the in the terms of motivation and inspiration and I'm sure you're doing this for other people. I'm sure you're going to do this for even more people. I'm going to do my part by lifting you up and putting you in a putting you in a higher position, so that you can then bring others up with you. Because I think you've got a mission in life, and that mission it's a it's Man. a mission of service. It's I a mission you. of yeah. Well, I thank you. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, <laughs> Rob Yarber, everybody, uh, uh, hope personified. Thanks, That's everybody. It. Rob does it all.